many times when you think about projects, about giving solutions to problems, uh, about addressing uh, solutions to some new thing that you might be thinking that could be useful, uh, we always end up in this position of thinking that it's all about a great idea. Okay? So I wake up in the morning and I decide, wow, you know, I was taking a shower, had this great thought, and now I know about the new thing that is going to transform our lives. Okay? What tends to always happen is that once you pass that moment of euphoria, where you actually have had this great idea and you think that you've solved the pr all the problems of the world, you start doing a little bit of a background check. And uh, it is very, very likely that somebody already thought about it. Not only that somebody already thought about it, but actually they developed it. And as they were developing them, they actually figured out it doesn't work. Okay? And all of a sudden, deeply depressed, you go back to bed, and then you wake up the next morning, and you have yet another great idea. Okay? Unfortunately, life is not as simple as that. Of course, great ideas do happen. And occasionally, there will be somebody that invented some app or something like that, that all of a sudden, out of the blue, gave a solution that made them multimillionaires. Okay? But in general, when you're dealing with complex problems, great ideas are very important. But great ideas need to be worked. You know, without the sweat, there is no real solution to the problem. And, and I think that this becomes a little bit daunting once you've done it a number of times, because you realize the magnitude of the effort that needs to be made to actually get one of these great ideas to really work. So I think that in many ways, this is a little bit where you are. You've been given a problem, okay? And this problem is extremely complex. This problem actually doesn't have a trivial solution. And this problem actually has been explored by many, 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 many people before. Maybe not with the specificities, you know, of what you're doing, but in many ways, it's been explored in a number of different ways. So people have attempted solutions. Some of them have been successful. Some of them have completely failed. And the question that is up for you is, how are you going to come up with a solution that is actually an adequate solution, and not only an adequate solution, but a solution that probably is better than anything else that is in the market? Because if there's anything in the market that is better than what you have, then all of a sudden, nobody wants your solution. Is that okay? So if you think about it and you start really trying to reflect a little bit, there's always this sort of big question that pops up. And this big question that really is the challenging part of starting any of these projects. And you know, as trivial as it might sound, the question is actually very simple. And it's just very simple. Where do we start or what do we do at the beginning? You know, how do we get on with this? You know, you've been given hints in the previous workshop, you've been told, you know, about the constraints, about all these things, but it's a daunting idea to look into this big problem and with the knowledge that you have and the understanding that you have, try to really get a good grasp of where do I start, okay? So, last week we discussed, why are you here? Now, this week I want to discuss, where do we start? Now you have your project, you know what you're doing, you have a sense of the challenge that's been put in front of you, and in general, this is what reality is going to be in the future. In the future, you're going to be facing constantly new problems that there's no solution for, there's no equation, you know, there's no problem-solving skill that will actually allow you to come up with the perfect answer. Fundamentally, you're facing something that simply is a new problem. And the question of where do we start in this whole development of this new problem is the first one that you need to think about. So if you were, now we have the problem. So where do we start? So any suggestions, any ideas? Where do we start with all this? What is the first thing that you think we should be doing if we're going to tackle this problem in an efficient way and probably come up with a good solution? Yes. Okay, so you've, you've given three things. Specifications and requirements, design brief, and the whole problem, okay? So he said, well, we need to analyze the whole problem. You know, we need to look at the design brief in a careful way. I presume you already have done that. And uh, have you? Good. And, uh, and then you have 
to look into the constraints or the requirements that are placed in there. Okay. Can you do that in a vacuum? Can you actually go through all these things, truly understanding the design brief, truly understanding you know, what is the overall view of the problem, and truly understanding what are the constraints? Do you have the knowledge? How much do you know about this problem? How much do you know about the background, the context, the place where this thing is set up? Do you have any idea, really, how does this design brief fit in the reality of everything that is out there? Is that the starting point? That's where all the information is going to be? Yes or no? No. Okay, so where else do you need to look? What else do you need to do? Yes. What, does, what do you mean by background research? Why are you so limited? Why the project before? You're assuming by saying that is that they actually had the right answer, or they had a very good answer, which is not necessarily correct. Uh, yes, of course, the projects before are a source of information, you know, a good starting point, maybe, but there's a lot more out there, no? Yeah, so you have to go exploring all different ideas that people have thrown into this kind of things. But, but you're all focusing on the solution. So to be able to put a solution, all you need to know is about other solutions. Keep in mind we've changed the rules of the game. Even if you looked at last year's project, you will find out that it's not the same as this one. It's fundamentally the same idea, but there's a few different changes which fundamentally changed the outcome. So looking at solutions, yes, it is a part of the problem. See what else is in the market, what other solutions are available. But what else enables you to start the process of design? Hmm? What do you mean by that? Okay, so you need to understand the new environment no? perfectly well. You need to understand what really means to be there and what are the actual needs associated to that particular environment. No? So you need to have a lot of knowledge. So in principle, you need to really understand your context. Without understanding the context, it is almost impossible to be able to put a solution. Okay? The context is a fundamental aspect of the solution. There is a shoe that fits a foot, okay? I cannot buy a shoe without knowing the size of the foot. Do we agree? Do you go shopping for shoes without knowing what size? You can't, okay? If you don't know what the foot looks like, there is no way you can buy a shoe. So the first thing that you need to really understand is truly understand the context. So. You know, it could be, in some cases, a place like that. You have a poor neighborhood in a third world country, and you need to provide some element of shelter in that space. You know, it could be a different scenario. It could be a beautiful beach in the middle of absolute nowhere. Or it could be a big city that for whatever reason, let's say you have a big concert, all of a sudden you need to create shelters, okay? Or it could be the context that you're talking about, you know, which is a desertic environment. Would you give the same solution for every one of the places? Give me examples, for example, what would make very different having a solution for the desert as opposed to having a solution for a modern city? Let's say you have 
a festival in a park and you need to provide solutions for a festival in a park. What will be the difference as opposed to having the desert? Okay, so basically you have all these basic supplies that doesn't require you to create things that are completely autonomous. Okay, so while you're in the middle of the desert, you will not have a sewage, you will not have electricity, you will not have any of the supplies, and therefore you have to be 100% autonomous. What else? Yes? Okay, so potentially, you might have a situation in which in the desert, you're going to have a very, very, very wide range of temperatures, no? Because deserts tend to be very, get very cold at night and be extremely hot during the day. So your shelter has to be appropriate for an extremely wide range of temperatures, while in the city, you might have a much more uh, narrow range of temperatures to operate with. That's a very good constraint. So what else? What else is different? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So basically, you have one system that is supposed to last for a number of years, while the other system is something that actually might be only deployed for two or three days, but probably has to be reusable. Because, you know, the, the owners of the shelters are going to want to deploy them again and again and again in different festivals. So there's completely different requirements, for example, of durability. You know, there's completely different requirements of ease of installation, for example. All these things are linked to the fact that once you install the shelter in the desert, it's going to sit there for three years, okay? And it's not going to move, so I don't care if it takes me a little bit more effort to put it together. It, I don't really care, you know, if it's a little bit more complicated, but I do care that it lasts for that period. As opposed to the other case where I do care how fast I can put it in and out, but I also care about, for example, how durable the joints are because I'm going to be pulling them off and on, off and on, and I might end up breaking them. So there's completely different conditions of durability. What else is different? Uh, you two, tell me something. What else changes in the context of, of that? You have to say something more than a smile. You have to say something real. What is the difference between being in a city or in a desert? Okay, so basically, again, you go back to durability. You see, very rapidly, you can have come up with something really interesting to say. You know, you have no access to repair. And once again, that very much plays with the durability. So the context is fundamental. So if you really don't understand the context you're designing for, you're going to design the shoe for the wrong foot. Is that okay? So you have to be extremely careful that there has to be a match between the context you want to design for and the design you're putting forward. So if that match is necessary, when are you ready to design? What do you need to know before you actually even get started with your design process? Say it. Can you just go and start designing and putting a solution for your shelter without understanding in depth the context you are designing for. Can you do that? Yes or no? No, thank you very much. You know, you actually can talk. Okay, you're allowed, you can express yourselves. Okay, no, okay, you can't. So the first step in trying to provide a proper design is a deep understanding of the context. Without the context, you cannot make a design correctly. The parallel of the shoe and the foot is exactly what it is. If you don't know the size of the foot, you will never be able to buy a shoe. Okay? So the context is fundamental. So that's the first pillar of being able to design correctly, is a deep understanding of the concept. So when you wake up in the morning and you're in the shower and you get this fantastic idea of a solution to this particular problem, then what happens? you're most likely going to fail because you haven't invested the time, effort, and energy to try to understand the context correctly, okay? So that is a fundamental element that is necessary. 
And the probability of failing is because you're not understanding your context well enough. So, what else? What else do you need to know? Now we know what the context is. I can describe exactly. I know the rainfall. I know the temperature range. I know the distance from any place that is actually reasonable to collect supplies. I know the kind of wind conditions that are going to have and therefore the loads that are going to be on my shelter. I know everything. I know the time that is going to have to survive, three years, whatever time it is. All this information that effectively tells me what am I designing for. Okay? What else do I need to know? Context on the side. Yes. Sorry? Okay, so clearly, financially minded individual has to make sure that actually has a control budget. Okay, so the budget is a fundamental aspect of it. So you really need to always know how much money you can spend. You cannot design something for a community that wants to pay $1 for the price of $100. You can never do that. So you need to get a sense of your market and your budget. In this particular case, we've given you that constraint as a constraint. No? So you more or less know how much you can spend and how much this thing can actually cost. So it's one that we can actually skip, but it is a true constraint of the problem. So this brings us to the concept of this. What does this image tell you? Okay, so this is something that somebody mentioned before. You need to know what the solutions that exist in the market are. Okay, fundamentally, you don't reinvent the wheel. Okay, once you know your context, you know exactly what the application is, then you can actually start looking into all the different solutions that could potentially fit that co set of context. Okay, you have a context and you have all the solutions that potentially fit that. Okay? You can have any sort of things. If you don't do that, if you don't look at all the other potential solutions that are available, it is clear that at the end, you're not only going to reinvent the wheel, but your wheel is going to come out square. Okay? And that's exactly what that image says. Basically, an individual cannot just come up and without really understanding what already has been done, be able to just simply throw their solution and say, sure, I'm, I have the best just because I think I have the best. Okay, so it is important to know other solution, and somebody had already mentioned that before. You need to be able to understand your objectives. So, what is the use, the purpose that this thing is going to be used for? It is not the same to design an entertainment tent like the one on the bottom left. It's not the same to design somebody's house. It's not the same to design a regular tent for camping or designing a shelter you know, for emergency purposes. We talked last time when we were talking about infrastructure failing, you know, we said, well, you have to deploy shelters in case everything goes pear shape. Okay? And the kind of characteristics that you put and the kind of detailing and the different things that you adapt to it are fundamentally linked towards the objectives of what you are designing for. So what are the, your, the objectives of this project? What do you think is the most important objective of the project you've been handed. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit louder? Okay, so the project is defined as building a research center. So then, what is the purpose of a research center? Is you would say, to do research. Okay? Now, what is what a researcher does in that particular shelter? What are the activities that are going to happen in that particular shelter. What kind of individuals are you going to have? Are you going to have children? Yes or no? Probably not, no? So, if you have children or you don't have children, do you need different provisions? Yes. So, let's say we're putting children aside. So, you're going to have researchers. Are you going to have male and female researchers? Yes, does that require different sets of provisions? Potentially. No? What age group are they going to be able? Can you guarantee that there's no major disabilities you have to cope with? What kind of equipment is going to be in this shelter? 
is it going to be terribly expensive and therefore needs to be protected in a certain way? What kind of power does the equipment need Oops. to be able to operate? Do you know that already? At the end, what is the objective? Is to enable the researchers to do their research. Is that the objective? Yeah. So when you think of enabling the researchers to do their research, then you have to start thinking of all the different provisions that fundamentally make this shelter fit for purpose. Okay? And that is absolutely fundamental when it comes to the design of the system. Okay? So here we have a set of objectives that has to be very clearly understood within a very clear context where we have a very good understanding of all the different components that people have developed in the past. So we know that we're not reinventing the wheel. Okay? So then the next step of the process is trying to understand the difference between these objectives and when it gives you a different answer. Now, if you look at those two images there, do you know who designed those cars? Ferdinand Porsche, okay? He designed both of them at the same time. There will be some people that will say that the Porsche 911 is fundamentally an enlightened Volkswagen, okay? And they might be right because it's fundamentally the same designer, at the same time, same technology, same type of techniques, fundamentally they are the same car. What makes them so different? What makes one car very different to the other? They're the same color. Yes. <laughs> Why? So you say James Bond never drove a beetle. I cannot hear. Why? They're very different that, because they're very different cars, no? You know, one gives you this sort of aura, you know, of the great spy, velocity, efficiency. You know, it's a fantastic car. That's why it costs a lot of money. So only rich people, you know, with bow ties and tuxedos can actually drive those cars when they go to the casino in Monte Carlo, okay? And the other one, it's a very different car, no? But it's the same technology. What is the difference, the fundamental difference between the two of them? What does it mean, Volkswagen? Does anybody know? Yes. Folks is people, wagon is car, okay? So it's a car for the people, okay? So one car was designed thinking extremely carefully about what the average consumer with low income needed. And they put all the technology that they had available towards designing the best possible car of that nature. That design survived 70 years, okay? And these cars kept being built under the same rules for more than 70 years. The other car, exactly the same, but it was designed with a different perspective in mind. It was designed for the racetracks, it was designed for the high performance user, it was designed for the rich user that wanted to use as a statement, and therefore they designed using the same technology a completely different car. The two of them have completely different objectives, effectively led to two fantastic products that survived for 70 years, but fundamentally they are completely different in nature. That's the importance of understanding your objectives. If you don't understand your objectives, you're going to try to sell a Porsche to a person that wants to buy a Volkswagen. Okay? And that's really the importance of a good understanding of what the objectives are of what you're designing. Okay? Then you have your constraints. That's the final part of the whole thing. There's the limitations. You have your context, you have your objectives, okay? And you have your constraints. So the constraints is the final part of the process, okay? Now, these are the things that basically you cannot do. 
These are the things that fundamentally are all the limitations towards your imagination. The other ones is all your tools, all your context, everything you have to play with, and your constraints are all the limiting factors that basically restrain the possible solutions you can come up with. So you can have all sorts of different constraints. And I can go one by one through all of this. And they can be very trivial or very complicated. So for example, if you look at the umbrella, that basically means, or I tried to explain, that fundamentally you want this thing to be waterproof. That's a constraint. So water cannot go through, okay? It stems from your objectives that I develop this constraint. So it's a place where there's rain, I don't want the water to go through. I have constraints in size, so I, for example, potentially would like to see this inside a box because it has to be transported. So everything has to be designed to meet a size constraint. There's very frivolous constraints like color. You know, people have done enormous studies, for example, on different appealing, appeal of different colors. So for example, what do you think is the most popular color when you're selling a t-shirt? Hmm? No, that's the second most popular. White. White is the most popular. Black is the, the second one. Okay? So if a manufacturer is going to produce T-shirts, okay, they're always going to go and build the biggest batches in white or black because those are the most appealing colors for a T-shirt. Okay? So it's as simple and trivial as that. You know, the same thing. What do you think is the, the most popular color for lipstick, some version of red, okay? And there's psychological foundations to that, and people have done endless studies into looking, for example, at the color of lipstick. So a manufacturer would not spend a fortune in creating massive amounts of green lipstick. Yes, of course, some people would like to put green lipstick on them, but not the majority, and therefore the amounts have to be shrunk. So that's a constraint. So you have constraints like weight, you have constraints like size. For example, you don't design cars that don't fit in parking spots, okay? I would love to have a, a mega super massive car, but fundamentally there is no market for that because it doesn't fit within the constraints of our roads, okay? So you design according to that. Now, the one that is very interesting is the one in the top. So there you have Barack Obama and basically a photograph that says, hope. This is one of the constraints that many, many people always miss, okay? It's the aspirational, okay? Many times when you design something, you might find the most efficient, the most effective, the cheapest, the, the most simple way of designing something, but nobody buys it because it doesn't reflect who we want to be, okay? And many times, that is one of the most dramatic constraints that makes products fail, is that it doesn't meet the aspirational needs of people. For many, many, many years, people have been trying to introduce different forms of sanitation into the third world, okay? So they've created all these different forms of toilets and all these different forms of systems to deal with human waste, okay? And because it's the third world, these are very poor countries, they don't have money, to actually be able to develop these things, then what do people do? They try to give them the cheapest possible toilet, okay? So they give them a tiny little cheap, ugly looking toilet, but actually it goes out for $8, okay? And you install 200 of them and nobody uses them, okay? Instead, you put one that is worth 200, you can only install 10 of them because you don't have enough money, but they look pretty, they look clean, they, they look, what we actually aspire at for us if we actually are moving up in society. And those tend to be readily used. Why? Because they meet the aspirational needs that people have. So in many cases, there's a lot of subjective constraints that we have to incorporate into our designs to actually get them right. And in many cases, those very subjective constraints tend to be much more important than the actual practical mathematical constraints that you put in your designs. So objectives have to be clear, the context has to be clear, the constraints have to be clear. So constraints define priority, okay? And you have to be very careful to keep the priority right 
so that you don't land in a situation like this. What's the problem with that object? So, what was the idea? People like to run or do exercise while they listen to music. Okay? Would that work? No. Okay? I mean, clearly somebody had a much better idea, no? Don't you think so? Yeah. So basically, that object is completely outside the context, okay? That object fundamentally doesn't respect the constraints because that disk is never going to work properly. You know, that object doesn't know what else is in the market because we could have an iPod and that solves all the problems and, and so forth. I can make all the lists. But this is the kind of things that we actually see, you know, in the, in, in the patent offices. Let me explain, to tell you a, a, a funny story about a patent. Does any of you know what the toilet snorkel is? So the toilet snorkel is a US patent that was basically accepted and everything and uh, never sold a single toilet snorkel. So the idea was, in the event of a fire in a tall building, you can make use of the air inside the pipes, the sewage pipes, okay? So in every toilet, of that tall building, you will have this mask with a snorkel that you can stick in the toilet until you penetrate into the pipe and you can breathe freely the air that is inside the pipe. Okay? So that the smoke that is coming from the fire doesn't intoxicate you and make you die. Let me, you know, rise of hands, who will be buying a toilet snorkel? You seem to be very interested in one of them. <laughs> it seems like a fantastic idea that actually nobody will use. Be okay? But that's, that's the shower moment. Okay? So that's the shower moment when somebody realizes, ah, there's fresh air in the tube, okay? and therefore I have to make use of it in the event of a fire. But the result is that nobody will ever use it. It's just like the image that I put you behind. Put behind. So that's the idea, okay? So if you think about it, don't turn your design project into a toilet snorkel, okay? Don't turn your design project into that shoe, you know, with a DVD player. You have to understand all the different components that are fundamental to be able to deliver something that is fit for purpose. So at the end, the message is very simple. So this is a short, very simple lecture, okay? You have to keep in mind what is the context? It is absolutely fundamental, okay? You have to understand perfectly well the details of your objectives, okay? And finally, you have to have very clear in your mind what are your constraints from the very pragmatic and very simple detailing technical constraints to the very subjective constraints that enable these researchers to do the work they have to do, okay? Now, to wrap up this whole thing, this is not easy, okay? Making sure that you understand context, objectives, and constraints takes a lot more time, a lot more effort, and a lot more energy than actually doing the design. If you understand those three things perfectly well, the design will flow in a very natural way. Thank you very much.